Ever wonder what a TPMS or a tire pressure monitor sensor looks like inside? Well, today we're going to take one apart. We're going to take a look at the internal construction of a TPMS sensor from a General Motors car. I just had to have one changed on my car today as the internal battery finally after six years died. So today we're going to take this thing apart and see what it's made up of. So today I thought I'd do something a little, a little bit different than I've done in the past and this is not going to be a repair video. This is going to be more along the lines of a, of a Big Clive teardown. We'll call this one a Big Dave teardown. Uh, what we're looking at here, this is a tire pressure monitoring system sensor and I just so happened that I got a message on the dash of my car, on the DIC as they call it, the driver information center, that told me that one of my TPMS sensors has failed. And what fails on these is, well, after about five or six years, I guess mine is about uh, uh, six years, I bought the car in 2011, it's now 2017, so, you know, after about six years, the lithium battery goes dead. So this is the first one that's failed. As you can see, these things have little radio transmitters on them and they operate in the 315 megahertz range. And here's the little sensor, a little hole here, which has got the pressure sensor in it, which measures the air pressure inside your tire. The idea behind these units is if you start to lose air pressure, you'll get an uh, alert on the car. And, and depending on what type of car you drive, some cars will just turn on a light that tells you that one of your tires, the air pressure is down and then you have to still get out your tire gauge and check your air pressure. And on higher end cars, it actually will tell you not only that you've got a low tire, but it'll tell you which tire is low and it'll also tell you the pressure of the tires, uh, the pressure of the air in each of the tires. And on mine, which is a Chevy Volt, it, it has that system. It tells me exactly how much pressure that can be measured in either kilopascals or pounds per square inch, and it tells me which tire. So this one here is dead. And I just had it changed. And I thought this would be an opportunity to open this thing up and just see what makes this thing tick. So I like this. It says replace valve and screw with every tire change. So this is actually screwed down to the valve stem. And it's, it's lives inside the tire. And here we go. Made in the UK. So that would explain why it lasted six years. If it had been made in China, well, who knows? Would you be able to trust it if it was made in China? Anyway, first... Uh, uh, order is to uh, get into this thing and uh, see whether we can open this thing up. Now these things are potted, they're filled with epoxy. Uh, there's a couple ways to do this. I could uh, uh, put a solvent on there to dissolve the epoxy or I could just use brute force and cut into it. And since I don't feel like messing around with a, a bunch of solvent and acids and stuff, I think we'll take the brute force method and just see if we can actually open the case up by cutting into it from the side here. We'll see how much of this potting material goes through here. As you can see, this whole unit is really potted well, which you would expect it to be because it's you know, spinning around with your tires, right? So they've done a really good job of, uh, of potting this unit. So there's the, uh, the unit removed from the outer jacket it's it's still just one big blob of epoxy so we're gonna have to break this down even more if we want to see actually what's inside this thing perhaps if we heat this up a bit we can get into it just fire up the bullet torch now I'm gonna be careful not to heat around the battery because I don't need anything explosive happening here but we'll heat up the rest of it and see if I can get the plastic to melt 
take the plastic off. And as you can see, that's actually working. Ah, so we have a circuit board in here. Now, let's just, let's just see whether now that I've removed the edge of it here, whether we're gonna be able to use a screwdriver here and just kind of pry the rest of this potting material off or whether I'm gonna to have to burn some more of it to get at it. But I think I can just get it underneath here and we can just pry this right off. Put a bit more heat on it. This time I won't be quite as extreme. I won't use the blowtorch this time because I'm going to be getting into the vicinity of the battery. I'll use my heat gun instead and see if I can get some heat in there to uh, get the rest of this thing apart. There's the battery. So I think what the first thing we'll do on this thing is I'll remove this battery so that I don't have to worry about uh, having a battery go off on me if I overheat it. But let's just take a look at what type of battery this is that's in here. This is actually a CR. What is this thing? It's a CR. Um, it's a Maxell. It's a CR2050HR. Three volt made in Japan. I've seen uh, 2032s and I've seen 2025s. This one's a 2050. So that's just going to be the capacity of the battery, this is a higher capacity battery and it's going to be obviously thicker. What we'll do is we'll just pop the tab off here so I can get the battery out. There's the battery itself, we'll just peel the battery out so we can actually look at the cell. Because this is a good size cell that's in this thing, wow. There, there's the battery out now, Let's see if we can get the rest of the, uh, we'll get the rest of the, the plastic encapsulation off of this thing. I'm trying not to stab myself again. As you probably saw, I wounded myself with the screwdriver there. And there's the cell. That's a pretty good sized cell. Look at how thick that thing is. You know, by comparison, I can grab a um, CR2032 here just so we can do a comparison. I actually have a, a CR2032 in my Nixie clock right here over my bench. So I have a CR2032 uh, in my Nixie clock. We'll just pull the battery out of there because uh, it's just used for backup and we'll use it to compare the thickness of this one down here. So here's the, here's the two batteries, a direct comparison between the two. For thickness wise, 
the 2032 on the left, the 2050 on the right. This is considerably thicker. I don't have a much higher capacity. I don't at the moment have my uh, pan tilt unit hooked up here on the tripod. As convenient as it is for being able to remotely uh, move the camera, it's so heavy that it, uh, I'm, I'm afraid it's going to make my tripod tip over and have my camera do a face plant. So I took it off just because that thing adds a lot of extra weight to the tripod and if it's if it was sitting on the head of a tripod as a tripod it wouldn't be a problem but because I've got it on an arm that's sticking out about two feet from the tripod it really throws the center of of uh, balance off and I was afraid it was going to fall over so I took it off and went back to just the manually controlled overhead camera so now that I've got the uh, the battery out of the way I don't have to worry about this thing catching on fire and exploding now we can throw a lot more heat on this thing and actually remove the rest of this, this this plastic. So let's get the heat gun going on full power here and we'll uh, take the rest of this thing apart. It's going to be so hot I won't be able to pick it up, I'm sure. Oh, it's not that bad. The pliers were sitting on my bench downwind and they're warm. <laughs> when this, this heat gun is on maximum power, it, it puts a hell of a lot of heat out. But, you see, it's, it's very effective because it, it makes the plastic just fall apart and then we can get a look at what's inside this thing some more heat I think is in order Ow. warm 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 very warm So what I'm holding this thing by, this is the actual uh, metal mounting stud that screws onto the tire. It actually goes right through the circuit board, which is good because it lets me uh, hang on to this thing. Now, I'm, some of the parts are actually coming off the board. I got this thing so hot that the solder is actually mel melting, I think. So I think a few of the chip components are falling off this thing as I remove this potting material, but we'll try not to remove too many of them. Oh, and if any of you guys wonder what these things should cost to have, re have them replaced, my local tire shop just replaced this TPMS sensor for $59 and that was including the parts and the labor so that gives you an idea and that's that's in, that's Canadian dollars in Canada it was 59 bucks plus tax that gives you an idea I called around to several other shops just to see and uh, well I called Canadian Tire and they wanted $69 for the sensor and another $20 to put it in. So, uh, and I called a dealer and they were um, even more. I think they quoted me $110 for a sensor. So, um, uh, you're best to call around when you need a sensor replaced, but uh, 59 bucks sounds to be a pretty good price to me because the sensors themselves typically run, you, you can buy sensors online for about uh, 30 bucks so uh, to change these things they actually have to take the wheel off the car demount the tire 
change the sensor and then well they balance it when they put it back on as well so I mean it's a fair bit of work to change the thing now I guess you might be able to get away without balancing the tire if you mark where the tire comes off and put it back on exactly the same but my uh, tire shop he threw it on the balancer to, just to verify that everything was good and of course they relearned the uh, the codes because uh, there's a procedure that you have to go through on your car so that your diagnostic computer knows uh, which position which wheel each sensor is on and that varies from manufacturer to manufacturer on the Volt you do it from the diagnostic or the or from the uh, main menu go to the tire pressure menu and you press and hold the so select key and it'll come up with a menu saying do you want to relearn you say yes and then starting at the front left and then to the front right the rear right and the rear left you use the scan tool to um, trigger the signal if you have the, the TPMS scan tool if you don't have a TPMS scan tool um, you let air out of your tires and uh, wait for the horn to beep and then um, move to the next tire of course you'll have to put the air back in but I've done it myself by uh, letting the air out of the tires, but they did it for me at the shop. Ah, oh, the smell of charring wood. That uh, heat gun gets pretty warm. Let's see if I can get the remainder of this uh, potting material off here just so we can have a closer look at uh, what is on this thing. That we've blown off a little capacitor here. A couple more parts I think came off here as well. Yeah, a few more chip components came off with the potting compound here. I don't know how much more we're going to be able to get off this thing, but we get an idea of what's inside this thing. We'll see if I can get some part numbers off some of these parts, and we'll look them up and just see exactly what they do. This. This, this one here is the pressure sensor here if I zoom the camera in as close as I can without it going out of focus. Here's our pressure sensor I see here and it has a number GE315 on it using my high power magnifier I can see that. It says uh, GE315 looks like. There's another number on there as well I can't quite read it. The, the pressure sensor IC just came off. I'm melting all the solder on the board. Let's see what other things can, we can get off this thing. Well, there the processor just popped off. All these other parts are just falling off because I basically heated the board up hot enough to melt the solder. So all these little parts are falling off here now. But that gives you an idea of what was on here. So that's basically what's inside a TPMS sensor. Uh, big thanks go out to all my supporters through Patreon. Uh, your support makes this channel possible. We'll catch you in the next video.